Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Johnson. Here we are at the sanctuary in Royal Illinois. Um, we're celebrating today Epiphany. Epiphany is that time, uh, is that a bit in uh, Matthew chapter 2, where it talks about the arrival of the wise men. And the wise men followed a star. Um, we had a, a Christmas program here for the kids uh, in early, mid-December. And we actually had this star. And this was the star that was there. We, it was held above the manger and they celebrated. And the kids came out and, and they, the kids were dressed up as wise men. And they came and they saw this star. And below the star was the manger. But, you know, after a few minutes, the light went out and the star was gone. But what do we have left? Well, in the mind of a lot of people, we still have a star. You see this little star right here? See that star right there? The one that's up here in the up here in the sanctuary, right here. That's a, a little tiny star. It's a distant star. It's kind of uh, pale right now, and we often forget what the star was. And I say that because you know that star actually was in the sky for those individuals they saw it at the time. We weren't there. We didn't see it. But there's another idea of an epiphany, and I'm going to share that with you right now. That whole idea of um, epiphany, uh, we understand it. We hear a lot of people talking about epiphany when something sort of pops into their head. Ooh, they have an epiphany. Something, uh, something has occurred to them. It's probably been rattling around someplace, and all of a sudden they become aware of it. Um, there are several ways in which we can describe epiphany within the Christian faith. I won't go into all the discussions about it. But there's uh, three examples. The one was about the Magi or the wise men seeing the, uh, seeing the, uh, the star in the sky. They go to the manger in Bethlehem. They see the Christ child. They recognize that this is something that's been foretold. They bend the knee, they bow down, and they worship him. That's the first recognition of the Son of God as King of Israel. Another epiphany that we can refer to uh, we normally do this many times in Christian churches, in various Christian churches, and we've done it here as well. Sometimes we recognize the epiphany as um, the baptism of Jesus. Baptism of Jesus is what takes place when, he's, uh, when he begins his ministry about 30 years of age. Uh, he comes out, uh, he comes down to the River Jordan, there's John the Baptist, they have the uh, John is baptizing people for a baptism of repentance. People are going into the water, and Jesus steps down into the water and is baptized by Jesus. Uh, excuse me, by John. As Jesus is baptized, we know the passage that says that a dove descended from heaven. It was the, we we as Christians refer to that dove as uh, it was a representation of the Holy Spirit that came down. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. We remember that passage. That is also considered an epiphany because there's the recognition by the people, as shown by God, that Jesus' ministry is about to begin. That is an epiphany. It's a manifestation or it's an appearance. It's become because people come to a new awareness. When a, when a king allows himself to be seen, sometimes there are stories back in the day when kings would disguise themselves. They would travel incognito. They'd, you know, they'd put on some uh, disguise so they could go out and be among the people. And then when they reveal themselves, they would, you know, he would take off his, you know, he'd take off the cloak that was covering up and he would be presented as, as the king. And they go, it's the king. And that would be, an epiphany, where the king makes himself known and seen. Today, we, we, we're going to use that word. I'm going to use that word a few times in this, in this discussion. We're talking about another sense of epiphany when people recognize him, not only as, as a, the person of Jesus, but as a, 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 a worker of miracles. This is the story about his first miracle. Remember? This is from John chapter 2, uh, and here's the story. It's the story about Jesus and the, uh, the changing water into wine. 
at the wedding in Canaan. Here's a bit about the background. Last week, we talked about John chapter 1, and in John chapter 1, um, John the Baptist is out there alongside the River Jordan baptizing, and this is what the passage says. It says, The next day John was saw Jesus coming at him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's verse 29. He again says that in a later verse. He says, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away this, who, who takes away the sin of the world." Here in verse forty-three, it says, "The next day." And did you notice that? It's verse twenty-nine it says, "The next day." Verse forty-three it says, "The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee," meaning he was going to go from where he was at, go up along the Jordan River, go north, then he would turn west. He would turn west. And he would go head towards Cana, where the wedding was to be to be held. He decided to go to Galilee, and finding Philip, he said to him, "Follow me." Now, Philip, very new to the faith, very new to this person of Jesus, and Philip decides to follow. Well, he's got Philip, he's got Nathaniel, he's got he's got Peter, James, uh, Andrew, and John. There's six guys. These guys are walking with Jesus, and they go up to Canaan. It says, uh, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. They've been traveling for a couple of days, at least two days. Now, what do you think happened there? Well, last week we talked about when, um, in verse, uh, I think it was 30, 35, that Jesus was walking and these two disciples, it would have been, Pete, it would have been Andrew and James, they were walking and they, because John had said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So they were walking after him. Jesus turned around and says, what do you want? And they said, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see, come and see. So they followed Jesus. The text says it was about the 10th hour. I believe that was verse uh, 42. He said it was about the 10th hour. And it said they spent that day and they came back and they knew that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Very short time. Very short time. They know who he, they know, they have this, this awareness, there's a manifestation, they have this awareness that he is very important. But what he's going to do now, he's going to show them something even more powerful that adds to their current understanding. So as I mentioned, these six, these six new followers of Jesus, they haven't followed him at all, except for just these couple of days, while they're walking to um, Canaan, where the wedding's going to be at. Now, think about what happens. How long is that going to take to walk uh, 70 miles? How long is it going to take? Now, remember, they were with Jesus just a few hours, you know, back in the previous verse, just a few hours before they, were, they had spent time with Jesus and he had discussed with them. And the following day, they went to, um, uh, Andrew went to his brother, Simon Peter, and said, we've just found the one, we've just found the one that Moses was talking about. So there was this recognition of that he had this incredible personality and insight. But what do you think they talked about on that trip that lasted, that traveled 70 miles? I don't know how fast they walk, but I'm not... I don't think they're running the whole time. I think they're probably talking and discussing. And what would you be doing if you if you've just been called, in the Phillips case, he was just called by this individual and he decides he's going to follow him. Peter and Andrew, James and John, Nathaniel's brand new as well. I'm thinking they're probably looking at each other like, uh, what's going on here? As he talks with them, he undoubtedly shares. Now, here's a key point I want you to remember. This is a key point. This is huge. This is maybe, it's, it's an understated, uh, undescribed, and very often unspoken uh, part about this text. This comes from the book of John. The book of John was written, obviously, by the person John. Here's what I want you to know. In John chapter 19, it talks where Jesus is on the cross and he's dying. John chapter 19, close to the end of the book of John. Jesus is up on the cross. 
he's hanging there and he's looking down at John and he says to John, and he points to his own mother, Mary. He points to John, he points to Mary, and he goes, behold, this is your mother. And he looks at Mary and he said, and he indicates to John, behold, this is your son. And the text said, from that day on, John took Mary to be in his home, which means he treated her like a mother. And Mary received this, this, uh, this word from Jesus on the cross. And so she went into John's house and John cared for her to the end of her life. Now, what we have here in this passage that I'm going to read, um, John writes this. There's the only, the only way John can know what has occurred here is because Mary told him. That's the only way. Here's what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. That may seem like a very singular incident, very unimportant. They just don't have enough wine at the meal. And quite frankly, it probably was. But here's what Jesus says. Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. What does that mean? His time to do those miracles, those miraculous things, those, those things to, to display his divine power, it wasn't time for him to do those yet. That's not what was happening. He didn't make that manifest. He didn't sort of come out in public and allow himself to be seen as a miracle worker. But Mary, because Mary was his mother and Mary has known him for these 30 years, she knows his character fairly well. She asked of him, they have no more wine. And the indication is, can you make something happen? But he responds, my time has not yet come. Then in verse 6 says, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding about 20 to 30 gallons. Well, we know the story. We know that he calls for water to be brought. So right now, Jesus is transitioning from a person unknown, and very quickly, it's going to become very obvious to all the people that this miracle has been done right when they were there. Here's what the text says. Um, he sees these six jars. Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they fill them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some, some out and take it to the master of the banquet, which they did. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had turned into wine. He did not realize that where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the, who had drawn the water, they knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. This is a huge factor. And said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and when the cheaper wine, and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. When the master of the ceremonies make that, made that known, I'm, I'm certain it just spread like wildfire. These people began to realize what just happened? Now, what would the groomsmen say, and what would the what would the uh, what would the bride say, and what would their families say? They knew right away what had happened because they ran out of wine. They ran out of the good stuff, and someone had to make that. He announced that. Um, I know this is a very simple simple example, but I heard this uh, some years ago. And it really made sense to me. Now, I'm going to mention a person here that most of the, eh, maybe the people watching this will know who I'm talking about. But I'd say anybody that's 35 years or younger, maybe 40 years or younger, would never have heard of this person. But this is a story about a man named Bing Crosby. Remember Bing Crosby? Oh, well, he was the, uh, he was that, uh, he was that uh, mellow tone voice back in the late 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, he was in the movies, and he was he was a good actor. And we many people just really appreciate him. 
Here's the story about Bing Crosby that fits in very nicely. It's a great illustration of what this means to have a manifest, uh, an epiphany. Bing Crosby was working uh, some nightclubs in uh, Palm Springs, and he was going home one night with his uh, road manager, and they were driving along the road, and he goes, man, I'm really thirsty. I'm really thirsty. I need some water. Well, he says, Bing, everything's closed right now. We can't stop anywhere. And he goes, he said, I'm really thirsty. I really want to get a drink of water. So they're pulling through these, these suburbs and passing all these houses. And he goes, let's just stop in here. And the guy goes, you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's two o'clock in the morning. You can't just wake somebody up. And he goes, sure I can. I can do that. So, so he pulls over, he parks the car, walks up, knocks on the door. The lights go on. And I'm thinking the person on the inside is pretty upset. The door opens and the guy turns the light on. He looks at him. He goes, excuse me. He said, my name's Ben Crosby. And the guy goes. I'm sorry, it was a lady. It was a lady. The lady opens the door and goes, Bing Crosby, you're at my house? And he goes, I'm sorry to bother you, man, but he said, I'm really thirsty. Can I have a glass of water? She goes, absolutely, Mr. Crosby, please come on in. Please come on in. And she shows him in the house and have a seat. And he goes, no, that's fine. I just want a drink of water. So they walk into the kitchen and she gets a drink of water for him. She gives it to him and they chat for a while. And he said, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that you've given me this drink of water. And she was like, that's any time, any, Mr. Crosby, anytime. That's one Bing, I've seen all your films. I, I love it. You're, you're a wonderful man. And thank you for coming by. So they walk back out and they get in the car. And, they, and the road manager goes, Bing, why did you do that? You just separated, uh, you just, uh, uh, you, got her, you got this family out of bed. You, you, you caused them some, you know, kind of stressed them out. <laughs> and Ben Crosby goes, no, no, it didn't. They're very grateful that I came. And you know, the really wonderful part is, <laughs> he says, he says, tomorrow when they go to work, and they say, you're never going to guess that Ben Crosby came to my house this morning at two o'clock. Nobody's going to believe him. Did you get that? Nobody is going to believe them because it's too fantastic of an idea that Ben Crosby would come and knock on your door at two o'clock in the morning and ask for a drink of water. But you know what? It really happened. Now, why do I use that as an example? Could God really come down and just show up at a wedding and do a miracle? Do you really believe that happened? I do. And the best part is, he's the kind of God that will do that for any one of us, any time. Yeah, he shows up at your wedding. We've had some weddings here. I've heard some messages by some, ama some amazing people. Not myself. And I've heard the presence of God declared and people just in awe that God has shown up, that Jesus has shown up. So here's, here's my question for you. This text says this. This text says, I will hold out, I will, I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you, and I will make you a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. I'm saying that that's what occurred with Jesus when he was alive. That the presence of God was with Jesus. He stepped into people's lives. And every one of those miracles that occurred, the presence of, the presence of God was known. This is a very simple question. I asked the kids in confirmation class. Why does Jesus perform miracles? Well, it's exactly what it says right here. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. Galilee, that's a foreign territory. Or that's uh, the territory to the north. He thus, he thus reveals his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. They, put their, they, they had this awareness because these, these six disciples that we know of that were there, these six disciples had heard him tell the story for these several days that he was walking. They discussed this thing. They shared this thing. They followed him with good intentions. And there he was at this wedding. He was asked, he was called upon by his mother to do this task. 
and he appropriated the power of God. That hand that was holding his hand, that hand moved so that Jesus would be glorified. Miracles happen so that Jesus will be honored as, as, as Christ. Now, I mention that because I believe that will happen in your life. On the back of the bulletin, it says this. When was the last epiphany you saw in your life? When you saw Jesus made manifest. And how will he show himself again next week? Be ready. Be on your toes because he will be there. Why are we like those disciples? Here's why. You know, those disciples walk with him, with Jesus down the road, up towards Canaan. They spent two days, I don't know how many hours, walking. They heard some stories. They heard some data. You and I have heard lots of data about Jesus. We know the story. He was born of a virgin. We know the prophecies about that. We know the time and the place. And we were told every year that's what occurred. That was the prophecy that was made. There are countless examples through the centuries where Jesus was seen. People came to faith. Dozens of stories, thousands of stories. Literally millions and literally billions of people have come to faith in Christ through the events, the statements, the miracles that have taken place. We know people that have had experienced that in, the, in their own lives. I have experienced that in my life. That's why I came to faith in Christ. When will Jesus call, call upon you? What, what will he display to you? For those of you that don't know, and there are people undoubtedly that are watching this video that don't know Jesus, they know about him here. They can speak about him with their lips, but do they have him living in their heart? Jesus says, I would come in, I would live with you. That's what he says in, uh, in the book of Revelation. But there's people that don't, they know about Jesus, but they haven't decided to follow Jesus. I, I've, I speak with people virtually every day that don't know Jesus. They know about Jesus, but they don't have Jesus in their heart. I'm mentioning this because that miracle, this kind of ties a lot of it together. Jesus, when he was with the disciples, he said, greater miracles than this, these things that I do, you can do even greater things than these. And somebody, somebody asked me one time, they said, what could be greater than raising somebody from the dead? What could be greater than uh, turning bread into wine? What could be greater than that? What could be greater than, than these miracles that Jesus did? Well, let me ask you this. Every one of those people that Jesus healed, what happened to them? You know the answer. What happened to them? Ultimately, what happened to them? They died. Every single one of those people, those thousands and thousands of people that Jesus healed while he was in Palestine, while he was in the Promised Land, while he was there, every one of those people died. What could be greater than that? You know what could be greater than that? is sharing the, your faith in Jesus Christ with other people. Because if people hear about Jesus, they accept him in their heart, and they come to faith in Christ, that's a bigger miracle because that results in a person having eternal life. Pretty impressive, huh? You know what? You have the power to do that. All you need, and you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about what you say. It says, it says in Matthew, it says, don't worry about what don't say don't even worry about what you say. Jesus says, it won't even be your words. It'll be the words of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of my Father that speaks in you. Just tell them what you know. Tell them you what you know. It's kind of you put the seed out there, just hold the seed out there, take it. They can do with them what they want. They can they can let it grow, they can throw it away, they can stomp it in the ground. But when you share that faith, what you know about Jesus with an, with another person, God will take that, plant it and cause it to grow into a faith that lasts, lasts until <laughs> eternity. We celebrate Epiphany. When's the last time you saw Jesus manifest in your life? I don't know what it was for you. I mean, I, it doesn't take too long for me to realize there's those, there's, there's those times throughout my life where he makes his presence known. 
keep a watch out for next week, okay? Because he'll show you something. Just be aware, because it's going to happen. I hope you're watching. Anyway, take care. Thanks for coming. Take care. Bye-bye.